So we've been talking about Malachi, and in the context of Malachi, we've said that it's, it's, uh, the theme is kind of passing the torch, right? It's, it's discipleship, passing our, our faith on. Um, and so the first week we talked about how you, you have to grab that blessing, right? There's the, the blessing of knowing God is, is there, and you, you have to, to grab it. Now, you know, in a theological aspect, we know that it's God that ordains all things, he works through all things, he's in charge, he's in control, but, but we are not sovereign, he is. And so, in context of our life, we don't know what he has planned and what he's done. So, there's this call for us also to respond. And we get to be part of that which God is doing in our lives and doing in the world, right? And so there's, we need to respond with a sense of immediacy, right? And then we also talked about, the following week, um, about the fact that we need to respond to it. We grab it and we work it. Work it. Thank you. <laughs> How did I? I'm so stuck on tonight. <laughs> yes. It's so not only do we have the work of grabbing it, but we have the work of living it out, right? Um, and so, in context with the, the priest, they had to do the sacrificial systems, um, they, they had all the, the laws that they were following, right? And for us today, there's, there's you know, this call for us to live out our faith, you know, to, to join together like this in service, to, to disciple other people, to, to spend time in his word, to spend time talking to him. There's work involved in this relationship. It's, it's like a human relationship. If you, if you don't put in effort and work, it grows stale, right? And so we can know that we belong to him partly because of the fact that we persevere and that we, can, that, and that we continue to work it. Um, and uh, also, in the context of relationships, we come to this week, and opening up, it makes me think about it. If you have a good friend, right, and let's say you're, you're eating out together, and you get something stuck in your teeth, right? A good friend is not worried about hurting your feelings, right? They're worried about helping you out, right? So they're going to tell you you've got something. You've you got you know, something right here, man. You've got to get that out, right? Otherwise, you're going to be really embarrassed walking around and showing this up. So a good friend, and, and even that's not much such a, a low level, <laughs> right? <laughs> but also, on a higher level, if a good friend sees you struggling with something, sees you doing something that's hurting you, right? Your, your good friend is going to talk to you about it, right? They're going to have this moment where they come to you and like, hey, I, I see you dealing with this. I see this going on in your life. I love you. And so I'm, I'm encouraging you to like, hey, can I help you with this? Do you realize that this is a problem you're having? Right? And and then they help you solve that problem. And so this is this is what God's doing except as your father. Right? And so looking at the, the message this week. Hold on one second. Atreus? You need to be quiet, bud. <laughs> I got to be a father. <laughs> Alright. So Malachi 1, 13 through 2, 9. God, the, the basic message here is deal with your crap, right? He's, you've got junk in your life. He's calling you out on it, right? He's calling the priest out on it, and he's calling them to repent. And remember, we talked about last week about the fact that God, God's word being given to us, God telling us about the, the junk in our life is an opportunity for repentance, right? And so calling us out on our crap is God's way of loving us. Right? If he didn't love us, he'd just let us keep going on with it. Right? He'd just watch us go on to destruction. But as a loving father, he calls us out. So I'm going to read this message, and then we're going we're gonna to dive in. So I started back in 13. And I think I did that for you too. Yes. All right, Malachi 1, 13 through 2, 9. You also say, look, what a nuisance, and you scorn it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring stolen, lame, or sick animals. You bring this as an offering. Am I to accept <coughs> it with your hands, asks the Lord? The deceiver is cursed, who is an accountable, who has an acceptable male in his flock, and makes a vow but sacrifices the defective animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says Yahweh of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. So what's happening here is, their, the sacrificial system is their way of being, their sin being atoned for, and them having proximity to God without being destroyed. Right? This is how the, the relationship is able to be maintained. 
And so first of all, they're bringing him junk, right? And then they're even, they have that, that which he's, he's called for to be used as a sacrifice. They actually have it, but they're withholding it. They're promising it, and they're bringing him their junk instead. And so to everyone else, so look, they're, they're saying, oh, here, I have this, right? But they're deceiving, and they're deceiving other people. They're not deceiving God, right? And then they're bringing their junk as an outlet. And two, it goes on, it says, therefore, this decree is for you, priests. So again, this message, it's not to unbelievers. This is to the church. This is to believers. This is people, he's, this is not a message that he sends to the unbelieving world, you know, You've got to do this, 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 this in order to have a relationship with me. Right? This is his message to the people who claim to have a relationship with him. Who have already heard the gospel. Right? And they are, they're not living it out. And he's calling them to it. Right? So, so this message is for you, my priests. If you don't listen, and if you don't take it to heart to honor my name, says Yahweh of hosts, I will send a curse among you, and I will curse your blessings. In fact... I have already begun to curse them because you are not taking it to heart. Look, I am going to rebuke your descendants, and I will spread animal waste over your faces. God has told me they're full of crap, and he's going to spread it on their face. He's kind of upset. Right? Um, and you will be taken away with it. Then you will know that I sent you this decree. So my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave this to him. It called for reverence, and he revered my name and stood in awe of me. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and fairness and turned many away from sin. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. Because he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. You, on the other hand, have turned from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have violated the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So I turn, in turn, have made you despised and humiliated before all the people because you are not keeping my ways but are showing partiality in your instruction. So I think there's two main points here we have in the text today. The first... Is you got to deal with your junk. you got to deal with your crap. You can't just let this fester and grow, right? And second is that you need to both have someone to, to emulate and you need to be someone to emulate. Right? So he, he's calling them out on their junk and what they're doing and their actions and how that's hurting other people. And then he gives them the example. He says, look, look back at Aaron. Aaron got this right. And a cool thing that you'll know, Aaron was not perfect. Aaron had his junk too. Right? And so he gives them something to emulate, but he gives them someone, he's like, look, here is a broken man, right? Also a sinner who was saved by grace, who followed me. But he didn't hide it, right? He didn't, he didn't let the junk fester. He dealt with it. Right? Here's an example of someone. There's many other examples in scripture as well. Right? And so, first of all, we need to deal with the junk. Second of all, there's a reason for that. We need to deal with our junk so that we can be someone to emulate. Right? So that we can be fighting towards peace and holiness. If we're allowing this junk to fester in our lives, we're not being a good role model of the gospel. And the gospel is not... The gospel itself is transformative. Right? It's not working in our lives if we're not getting rid of the junk. So first of all, a, a question to ask, and, and looking, you know, here in the text, we see what their mess was. Their mess was that they weren't taking this seriously, right? That they saw the sacrificial system which brought about their atonement as a nuisance. The question then is, what is our mess today, right? It, it could be as little as like, well, going to church is a nuisance, or um, going to Bible study is a nuisance. Reading God's Bible, you know, where is a nuisance. Spending time with God is a nuisance. You know, that's something that, like, I do when I have time. Yeah, but I think that's on a very, a very low level, right? 
Um, another thing to think about as far as like, what is our mess? You know, what is it that you do that nobody else knows about? You know what I mean? What are, what are those things that you're, that you're, that you're hiding? You know, that you're struggling with that no one else knows you're struggling with. Or even, you know, what are those things that, that you do blatantly, but you argue with God about whether or not it's right? Right? So first John talks about that. If, if, you, if, you, if you say that you have no sin, you know, you're, you're, you're deceived, right? And then if you call what God calls sin, not sin, you're, you're arguing with God. You're calling him a liar. Right? So both of those are a way that we deal with mess. So there, there's two responses. If, if we're living with mess as Christians, and we're not dealing with it, we're, we're either hiding it or we're arguing with God about it, it affects the people around us. Right? So, you know, to go back a little bit, Malachi here, you know, it was a message to the priests, to the leaders in Israel, right? And so if we just look at it like that, we can look back and like, okay, so here's these priests that are messing this up, and we can we can learn about these leaders. If that just translates to modern day pastors, right, then still that's not very applicable to us. And it definitely does translate to modern day pastors and leaders in the church. But guess what? In this covenant, we all are the priesthood of believers, right? So we all are representatives of Christ. We all have access to God, right? So back then, it was just the Levites who were set aside who could go and, and they performed the sacrifices for the people and they had access where they could go and offer up prayers for the people. But now we, there's no longer a Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is in our heart, right? So if we have a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit is in us. So we are a priesthood of believers. So this is applicable to each of us, right? So when I'm living out my faith, whether I'm doing it well or wrong, I'm setting an example to the world. I'm proclaiming the gospel to the world, but I'm proclaiming, I can either be proclaiming the gospel or a messed up version of the gospel by how I'm living. So when others see us in our mess, and, and, we're, and we're not dealing with it well, right? They either reject all Christianity as equal to what we're selling, or by God's grace, they just reject our version. Right? So if we're arguing with God about what is sin, we're, we're living in sin purposefully, right? And other people see us doing that. We're calling ourselves Christians. We're doing this. Then they're either going to be like, I don't... This doesn't really look any better than anything else. You're, you're a hypocrite, right? They're like, I can read your Bible and understand that you're not living this out right. right? So then they either reject Christianity altogether and say, y'all are just a bunch of hypocrites. And they'd be right, right? At least about individuals or, or individual churches. Um, or they just, by God's grace, reject our version, right? And follow someone else who's actually living. The second thing is that they follow our example and reproduce the crap that we're living in. Right? So it's harmful to them and those who observe it as well. So if we're living in, living in sin as a Christian, we're not fighting against it. We're even saying it's okay. We're not dealing with it. You know, we're offering up these crappy sacrifices in our life and how we live and how we interact with people. Right? We're being hateful towards people. Right? Whatever. We're living in sin in any of them numerous ways and people don't reject it and they follow our example right so you're going to reproduce what you're living out and so we that that's this we have this weight of we need to be living this out well we need to be digging into his word and be convicted and changed by his word because if not we're leading others astray right we're going to lead them right off a cliff with us so there's this way that we need to, with immediacy, respond. We need to agree with God about what is junk and what isn't junk, right? And we need to fight against it. We can't keep offering up these crappy sacrifices and calling it okay. Right? We need to be living it out. So it's, it's harmful to us and to others and to the others that, they, that see them living it out, right? And so... I wanted to give us three examples, three steps of how to deal with our mess. First of all, and I gave you three E's. I was trying to make it easy. 
So first, you gotta expose it. Right? And so part of how you expose it is, is by spending time in the scriptures, by spending time in community, right? By spending time praying, asking God, God, reveal my blind spots, reveal to me the things that I'm doing that are that are wrong. Right? Also asking some, some friends that are close, that are Christians. You're like, what do you see in my life? Right? That 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 I'm not seeing. You know, would you would you let me know about the spinach in my teeth so that I don't keep walking around with it? Right? Or would you you know, would you help me be a good representative? And, and so you're you're giving trust, you're, you're giving permission for someone to speak into your life. Right? But you have to do the work of, of exposing it. Right? And not just exposing it. Part of exposing it is, is confessing it, right? So it's, it's the idea of saying, okay, yes, you showed me this sin. I have this sin. Right? And yes, it is sin. And you're confessing it. You're agreeing that it's wrong. And then after you expose it, right? So after you've looked and you've seen the symptoms, you realize you have the disease, <laughs> have the sickness, whatever it is, you have to excrete it. You have to get it out. We're kind of staying on the crap. <laughs> but right, so once you, it's not enough just to say, yes, I have this problem in my life. It's not enough just to say, yeah, this is wrong, this is sin, I, I'm not even happy with this, I'm, I'm, ash you know, I'm ashamed or whatever, I can do this. You have to do something about it. Right? You can't just live in it and every day say, yes, I have this. You know, Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me for this. This is wrong. This is bad. Right? You have to do the work of getting it out of your life. It's not enough to confess sin. We need to fight to get it out of our lives. Otherwise, we're just, there's this confession and convincing. Right? You know, confession is, is saying that I have this problem, and, it, and then there's this convincing that leads to change. Right? So if I don't get it out, then I'm just, you're basically saying, it's okay, I, I realize this is a problem, I realize this is a sin, but I'm a sinner saved by grace, and it's okay. Right? And, and so either you're saying, it's okay, I don't need to actually get it out of my life, or you're saying, God doesn't really have the power to change me. Right? And man, that takes all the power out of the cross, and the resurrection, and the Holy Spirit, right? If we can't get sin out of our life, then why did he send us the Holy Spirit to abide in us? Where's the power? We have the power. But if we don't fight, then other people, are, they're not going to see the transformative power of the gospel in us, right? And so then we're not modeling the work and the power of the gospel in our lives. And so for them, it's like, well, okay, they admit they've broken, that's cool, they're pretty humble, but they can't do anything about it. Maybe I'll go try a different religion that actually can do something about it. Right? Or maybe I'll try some self-help books. Right? Because if it's all just about, <laughs> you know, about that, but you, there, there's many ways to get things out of your life if there's no power in the gospel. Right? And finally, after excreting it, it's not enough just to get it out of your life. It's not enough to, to confess it, to get it out of your life. You have to radically work to eliminate it from being a possibility of coming back. Right? So, I mean, I, I think we all have had struggles that we've had, that, that you work against this, and you finally get it out of your life, and you, know, you, you admit that it's wrong, and yet you finally, it's like, it's not a problem anymore, but you, you also need to put up boundaries where it's going to seep back in. Right? Um, there was a quote by Stephen Taylor that said, you don't just wipe away the web. Right, the cobwebs. You've got to crush the spider. If you don't crush the spider, you're just going to come back and make another web. Right, so, so after confessing and changing, we need to guard against it being a possibility again. We need boundaries and accountability. We have to be extreme. Right, when Jesus was talking in Matthew, um, at the end of the Beatitudes, he was talking about fighting against sin and lust. And he said, man, if your, if your eye causes you to sin, fuck it out. Right? And I'm, don't, he's speaking like metaphorically here, don't, don't actually pluck your eye out. Um, or if your hand causes you to sin, chop it off. Right? He's saying, be extreme. It's better that you would end up in heaven, in eternity, without a hand, 
than it would for that sin to kill you. Right? That sin to have that power over you forever. And so, I mean, and if it came down to it, I guess, but what I'm saying is, you know, maybe you're struggling with you know, a particular sin, and it means when, so say you're dating somebody, right? And, and you struggle with affection that should not be there until you're married, right? And so you finally, you, you agree that this is a sin, you, you work to make sure this doesn't happen again, but then you have to put up boundaries where you say, okay, we love each other, there's chemistry here, that's a good thing, God made us, you know, that way, that's okay, but we're going to not be alone together in our, in our house, you know, at any time, because if we are, <coughs> we know things could happen, right? Even if we're like, you know, we're resolved and we're fighting against this and we're not going to do this, we're setting up some boundaries. And also, you know, have some friends that you can have hold you accountable, so they know that you're spending time with your, your loved one tonight, right? Going out on a date afterwards, like, hey, how'd it go? It was good. You know, you have this permission, this person in your life that has permission to ask you these prodding questions, right? To help you hold, to hold you accountable. Right? Again, this is not to earn God's salvation, not to earn his love, but as a way of, of you fighting against sin in your life, fighting against the, the crap that's holding you down, right? and helping you to be a good representative of the gospel, right? help to not hurt your witness. Because right? if, if we, are, we are representatives of Christ, so if we're living with this junk in our lives and we keep falling to it all the time, it, it holds back our witness to others. You know what I mean? And again, the idea is not that we're perfect. We can't be. Right? But we can have victory over <laughs> sin in our lives. And we're going to keep coming back to it probably in different ways. Right? So, you know, at one point in your life, it might be, you know, physical affection. And then later, it might, shoot, I was, I used to be married. I'm divorced. Right? So after being divorced, I struggled with lust. I struggled with taking care of things on my own, right? That I shouldn't have been doing. Um, and so I had to, I had to involve guys in my life to be like, hey, I, I knew that this is going to be a struggle. So it's not even just that I'm a young man and, and I'm attracted to women, but I used to be married, so I know what love feels like. And now I have to live without it. Right? And that is hard. It's hard enough before you know what good love feels like. Right? Um, and so then I had to give people permission, you know, to ask questions in my life. I had to, I had to come Best when I would make mistakes. There are points in time where I would just decide, you know what? <laughs> and who cares? Um, I'm only going to shower at the gym. You know, I'm going to be extreme because then there's the, <laughs> I'm just making sure that there's no possible, you know, points in my life. And so I had to be extreme against fighting against sin so that I could, for the purpose of being holy, for the purpose of being a better reflection of God. And I tell you what, like as I overcame that, Man, that, that built my affection for God, too. Because as sin struggles in our life and just holds us back, it, it just festers and it brings shame in your life. Right? When you continually fall to sin, you feel powerless. You feel messed up. You feel unlovable. Right? And it's not true. And that's why it's so necessary to fight against sin in your life. Right? Because you have the power. The gospel is transformative. Right? And, and you need that just for you. Just for you to experience God's grace. His grace of helping you combat sin in your own life. And feeling greater affection for him as that the weight of that has been lifted off of you. And so part of that eliminating it too is starting to hate the sin. At first, we'll be honest. You probably love it. And so that's the hardest part, is admitting that it's sin and it's wrong. Right? And so that's part of the, the struggle to fight against it, too, is because you even, you like the effects of sin in your life. And so as God's working in you, you, you learn to hate it. Because the problem here is the same problem that Eve had in the garden. She liked what the fruit could do for her more than she liked the relationship she had with God. Right? It wasn't just disobedience. It was like, that looks really good. I love you, I'm in a relationship with you, but I'm willing to disobey you to have that, because I desire that more than I desire this. Right? And so there's, we have to get to the point that we, we hate what this does to us. 
We hate what this does over here to our relationship with God. Right? And we even get to the point that when we're finally free of it, we're like, I don't ever want to go back. Because I remember the way that made me feel. And I remember what that did in my life. And I realize what that's going to do to other people. So if I'm selling them this kind of Christianity where I'm living in this and I'm struggling and I'm never overcoming this and I'm lying about it and I'm just putting on a mask when we're in church, right, and then just struggling the rest of the week, then I'm going to lead these other people right off into this mess as well. And let's be honest, the gospel in church is messy enough already because we're all having to come forward and be like, I'm broken. I'm a part of this broken world. Right? And, and so... Even more messy to just hide it and just feel broken, but then lie to each other and say, I'm good, things are going well, I'm happy, right? That's even harder than just being, being real and saying, I've got mess, would you help me? It's really hard at first, but as that starts to, as you have that community where you can say, hey man, I just, I just messed up, I'm having a problem, you know, would you pray with me? That starts to the curse that you see it in Genesis and you can, you can expose yourself metaphorically <laughs> to one another and say this is who I really am, this is what I'm dealing with this is how it's making me feel right, and that person still loves you and they don't reject you and they say I understand man, I'm dealing with this too, you know, would you pray with me as well let's, let's fight against this together start to fall in love with that. That's the gospel. That's what gospel community is supposed to be like. And so off that, that first part, again, just to, just to remind you, that, that junk in our life, you have to expose it, you have to excrete it, and you have to eliminate it. And then there's also in that, and we can't do that on our own. Right? God didn't save us to be Orphans to be over here and just struggle and fight against them on our own. He, he saved us to be in community, in a relationship, as part of the family. Right? So we need family to help us with this whole process. Right? And as an example of that, I found the story in 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 14. Here's, here's David, who is the man after God's own heart. Right? He's, he's our hero. God made this covenant with David that he's going to establish an everlasting kingdom through his lineage, and his descendant would sit on this kingdom forever. Right? David, David is a great guy. A lot of junk. Right? Just like us. And so here's an example. Um, David was supposed to be out of war. I believe it was the spring. Right? Okay. Thank you for the nod. <laughs> he was supposed to be out of war with his men, and for whatever reason, he's not. He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's being lazy, he's being complacent, staying back in his palace, um, walking around on the roof, and he eyes up this hot girl over here taking a bath, right? And he doesn't just, look, look, you know, you know, keep going, and oops, I shouldn't have seen that. He keeps looking, and then he, he asks about her, right? And he asks to have her brought over to his house, Falls into sin, right? Sleeps with her. She ends up getting pregnant. And then when she gets pregnant, he tries to hide it, right? So he calls her husband back um, from war and tries to send him home to sleep with his wife so that he might think that it's his baby, right? But this man is a righteous dude. He's like, nah, man, my guys are out there fighting. I can't go back and be more with my wife while everyone else is struggling and fighting. I, I should be out with them. If I'm going to be back here, I have to obey my king. You have to be back here, but man, I'm just going to stay here. I'm not going to go back and enjoy the pleasures of my wife, right? So finally, David's like, I'm not going to be able to hide this. So then he sends him back to battle, and he sets it up so this guy's killed in battle. So first of all, he commits adultery. Second of all, he commits murder to hide it. He doesn't just expose it. He hides the mess, and it festers and gets bigger, right? So then here, in 2 Samuel 12, Nathan comes to him. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he arrived, he said to him, and I love this. This is also, yeah, as we went, I think this is a good reflection of what you see in Malachi too. 
Nathan tells him a story. Right? So there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except for one small ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it and it grew up, living with him and his children. It shared his meager food and drank from his cup. It slept in his arms and it was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die, because he has done this thing and shown no pity. He must pay four lambs for that land. Nathan replied to David, you are that man. Right? And so, so he's going to go on. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Right? He tells him the story. It's kind of like how Malachi starts out. Hey, remember Jacob and Esau? Remember how bad Esau is and how he despised the Lord's blessing? And then even when I punished him, he stood up and just shook his fist at me and said, I'm going to raise it up on my own. He's going to be crushed. And then he turns to them and he's like, y'all are Esau. Right? You're doing the same thing. You despise my blessing. You have the sacrificial system. You've been chosen by me for relationship. And here's how you can atone for your sin. And you're angry that you have to do work to have a relationship with me. Right? And then second, so just there, it's great that you see how they tell these stories and set them up. Um, but also, here, you see that he has a friend. He has someone he, you know, the Old Testament Israel is like the New Testament church. Right? And so here in this church body, Nathan has accountability for David. He comes up, man, you're messing up. You jacked this thing up. You're making it look bad. You're the king. You're supposed to be the representative. And you're doing evil. Right? And the result for him coming to him and explaining this and showing him this is that David repents. Right? They expose the mess. Sometimes you might be blind to it. You need someone else to come up and be like, man, you're jacking this up. You realize what you're doing? And we should do this lovingly, right? And we're, this is people in community. This is not you going to a non-believer and saying, man, you're, you're messy and you're doing this wrong. This is people in, already in relationship with God. To a non-believer, we just we tell them the gospel. We tell them that God created us for the purpose of intimacy with us. We, we're all messy. This world is cursed and we're part of that curse, right? And you need salvation. Here, here it is. Here's God died for you, right? But to those in the church, they've already heard that. And so they're despising the blessing when they're ignoring the crap in their life, or when they're hiding it, or when they're arguing with God about it, right? And so we need other people in our lives to help us expose it. And we need to be humble so that when they come to us, we don't argue with them. Like, right. I, I did mess that up. Would you help me? Right? And so, again, they're coming to us. We're going to them for the purpose of restoration, for the purpose of helping them, not for bringing them shame, not for hurting them, right? Not for making them feel bad about themselves, but for helping them and for helping them get out of that mess. It's a helping hand, not a smacking hand. <coughs> God gets to do the smacking. <laughs> and so all of this is for the purpose of setting the example. Right, we, we talked a couple weeks back about the idea of discipleship. Right? We talked about 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10, where it was basically, you know, you, you've heard the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then you saw me mimicking Christ, and then I, you know, I taught you to mimic me, and then you mimic me, and got other people mimicking you. And so there's this idea of setting the example as part of our discipleship process, as part of our spreading the gospel, is by living it out and teaching other people. We need accountability for that. Um, and so, again, you know, the example that you set is the example that you will reproduce. And so if you're not fighting hard for this, you're not working in this, you're going to teach other people to be complacent. You're going to teach other people to kind of have a nominal Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we want to spread. Right? So, you know, for each of us as an individual, we want to be fighting to be on fire for God. We want to be desiring and praying that we would fall more in love with him each day. And that that would transform our lives. 
right, for the purpose of us having greater intimacy with him and for the purpose of us leading others into greater intimacy with him. Because it's not enough for me to just, for me to have greater intimacy with him. If I'm not reproducing it, I'm not obeying him. He commanded us to go and make disciples. He didn't command us to go and be transformed just by ourself and be the great holy man. Right? We're, we're too blessed to be a blessing. To be a blessing, to be a blessing. It should go viral. And I like the fact that he, and I already talked about a little bit, the fact that he uses Aaron as an example, because again, even thinking about you know, who you're mimicking, if you're looking, there's a lot of celebrity pastors out there, right, who have great teaching, who, you know, there's, there's, there's ones with bad teaching too. <laughs> but there's a lot of ones out there with good teaching as well, right? But understand that that good teacher that, that, you're, that you're mimicking, that, you, that you're watching, they are also just in need of the gospel as you are, right? So they also have sin that they struggle with or sin that they're overcoming. So, you know, if you're, the person that you're look, you look up to falls, that can't shake your foundation. Right? You, you understand that they are saved by grace as well. Right? And hopefully, that person like Aaron, like David, when they fall, they'll be restored. Hopefully, there'll be people around them that will love them, speak into their lives, and for the purpose of restoring them, not just for slamming them and keeping them down. But the same for you. When you mess up, you want people to love you enough to help you be restored. You don't want them to be like, nah, saw you. You're not so good anymore after all, right? That's not the goal. And so, you know, really just to, to end this, you know, I don't remember if I talked about it in the service last week or if I just texted it to you guys later in the week, but Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Right, so, so here, Paul in the New Testament is telling us that our lives are our sacrifices. Right, and so how we live our life, we don't want to be offering up these junky sacrifices like they were in Malachi. Right, how we live our life is our is our how we worship God. We don't just worship God by singing songs on Sunday. We worship by how we interact with our kids on Monday, by how we interact with our coworkers on Tuesday, right? by, by what we watch in the middle of the night when we can't sleep on Wednesday. All of our life is a reflection, is, a, is, a, is an act of sacrifice, is an act of worship to God. And he says, don't be conformed to this age. Don't live like everybody else. After you've been saved out of that, don't fall back into it. Right? Repentance is not just confessing you have sin in your life and you need a Savior and then you have permission you know, to, to live like that, but you have that get, get out of jail free card. Right? Repentance is actually turning and going the other way. Repentance is a transformation in your life. Because I'm not, I'm not going this any way anymore. I'm now part of this kingdom. And so we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. Right? So we're involved in this. We're actually fighting against sin in our, in our minds. We're, we're deciding to do things differently. Right? And we're acknowledging the power of God to do this. Right? We, it's not just, I'm going to decide I have the power, I'm going to do this. If we could do that, we don't need Jesus. But, Acknowledging we have Jesus, acknowledging we have the grace, we we are deciding we are we're pointing our ourselves in another direction and we're fighting for it, knowing that we have the power, and we're discerning what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Right. So so not only are we we decide to do this do life this new way, we're also constantly evaluating what's going on around us. Is, is this okay? Is this something I should be a part of? Or, 
Or, you know, I take this in, mm, no, nope, that's not true. That's not okay. That That's going to be harmful to me. You know, I need to, to be over here. Or, or even, um, you know, God has me going in this direction instead of this direction, just as far as God's will. It's not always necessarily right over wrong. It's what does God have for me, right? So let us be making decisions this week, right, to, to change, to be transformed. And, and so, you know, a lot of what I focused on is, is the junk in our lives at an individual level, right? And, and how as an individual we need to be a good representation. Um, you know, also we need to think about that as a church, right? So as an individual, we have to be a good representation. As an individual, we have to get the junk out of our life. And we're, we're fighting, we're struggling, we're, we're working at this, right? And as a church, we also need to be, to be fighting to be a good representation of God. Right? So this week, um, I got together with some friends and we watched the video 13th documentary, right, on racism in the United States, and to it, if anyone's interested, we can watch it, you know, as a, as a church in my house on Friday, it's a really good documentary about, ah, man, our, our, our nation's history, and even still what we struggle with today, as far as racism, throughout the whole system, and one of the things that struck me as we're sitting here watching this and talking about it afterwards, was how, it, you know, it, this is prevalent in our church as well, in our church collective. Right? Um, you know, one example with, with racism in the church is, is like the whitewashing of Christianity. Right? So, for instance, if you're looking at church art or even looking at covers and books, even in seminary or Christian bookstores or um, in churches, you'll see white Jesus. Right? So, for some reason, you know, a Middle Eastern Jewish Jesus is not, is, is not okay. We have to make him white. Right? And, and, and that is a sin. And that is wrong. That's crap that we're offering as a sacrifice to God. The words inside a lot of these books are great. It's great theology that teaches us, that, that we use in our seminaries. So, I mean, I had multiple books from last semester, right? And there's white Jesus on the one, or the painting of the, is it the Sistine Chapel with, with God and Adam? God is not white. <laughs> it, has this, it has the white God with white Adam. And it, First of all, in Scripture, it tells us not to have, not to make an image of anything in heaven above or on earth below and worship it. When we depict God as white, and we put him in a church or we put him on a theology book, we're making an image, an idol of God, for worship. And if you're white, it's easy for you not to see the problem with that. Right? <coughs> you don't even realize it. But if you're not white, what does that tell you? You're a less than image bearer of God. Right? It says, God is white, but I'm not. Is he, is he my God? Maybe, maybe he's more their God, not as much my God. Right? That that harms people. Right? And first of all, it's just wrong. God said not to do it. And so, man, why are our publishers okay with this? Why are our seminaries okay with this? With, with printing this and handing it out? Why are churches okay with this? It's crap. And so we, you know, at least as a church, I'm throwing those books away. So I'm like, do you want to reprint this and do it right? I don't care if the, the picture on the cover is just blank with the title. That's going to be better than putting an image on who you think might sell better. But harms my non-white Christian brothers and sisters. It tells them they're less than an image bearer of God than I am. So this is just one example, right? And there's something that we can do about that, right? We can we can talk to our blessed church, but we'll never buy any of those books. Um, but you know, we can challenge seminaries. Like, man, why would you why would you hand this out? Why would why are you okay with this? We can challenge authors. Man, why would you allow them to print this picture on there? <coughs> right? We can hold each other accountable for how we talk. Right? For, for how we're loving people. So that's just an example. Church collective as well. And things to be thinking about. Right? Challenge your own perspectives. Have conversations with people that disagree with you. Have conversations with people that don't look like you. Get, get some of those people in your lives. Right? Hopefully, my, my prayer is that our church 
would not be so homogenous in the future, right? So that we would, we would be a better reflection of God's image by having more of a diversity. All right, so how about I pray for us and we, we say, Lord, thank you for loving us enough to show us the junk in our own lives as individuals and as a church. Thank you that, that this is not just a message of you beating us up or telling us we're not good enough, but it's a message of you loving us enough to call us out on our junk so that we can be changed, so that we have an opportunity for repentance. Lord, help us not to be indifferent to, this, to our sins or to the hurt that our sins cause to other people. I pray for change, Lord. I pray that, that, that we would know the power we have by the grace of the gospel to change, to act differently. 